All right, welcome to the next or second lecture regarding the history of medicine and disease. So we left off last time with the primary theories of infectious disease being the four humors and the miasma or uh, bad air theories of medicine. Um, we also uh, just left off where the Renaissance was starting to uh, increase knowledge and particularly scientific knowledge. And Robert Hooke had uh, created a microscope as well as Antony von Leeuwenhoek. So they were starting to view microbes for the first time. So uh, <clears throat> industrial era medicine occurred 1750 to 1900, a little more like in the late 1700s or the early 1800s, but we will start right there. So theories that ended at this time were the four humors, supersti superstitious and supernatural ideas, astrology, and God as the primary cause of illness. Theories that continued were miasma, and uh, the reason this continued was because the industrial world was also filthy with poor sanitation. So in effect, it wasn't the miasma that was causing the disease, but it was the substances responsible for the miasma that were causing the disease. Uh, poor sanitation, meaning um, human waste, uh, animal waste, um, animal parts, um, stagnant water, all kinds of things like that that were causing um, the bad smells were the source of infection. But in this case, people could see it and smell it, so they thought that this caused a disease. Um, there was a, a great stink of 1858 in London where uh, the city became so polluted, the, the River Thames became so polluted that people basically rebelled and said something's got to something's got to change so again going back to the living conditions the towns were growing and growing and growing 85% uh, of people in you know uh, western societies now lived in cities there was overcrowding poor sanitation no running water people like in apartments shared one toilet um, and there was just the start of sewage systems, so um, nothing really in place yet. In 1700, there were very few hospitals. Uh, doctors like, um, uh, as we saw in Washington, if you listen to that, um, they would just be called into a person's home. In the 18th and 19th centuries, new hospitals did begin to appear because of the massive growth in, growth in cities. But they weren't really places of healing yet. They had high death rates due to infection. The nurses were untrained, uh, unclean equipment, wards and operating rooms. They were filthy places. And a nurse was basically just above a hooker as far as, you know, their um, the pride of their profession. Um, and they, as they did, um, we still believe in the miasma theory, they aired out the wards once or twice a day, which I think was probably a good thing, uh, um, <clears throat> but still wasn't enough to um, control the spread of infection in hospitals. So the leading cause of death in 1850s America, the primary one was tuberculosis, and then following that was dysentery, cholera, malaria, typhoid fever, pneumonia, diphtheria, scarlet fever, meningitis, and whooping cough. Cough. And these are all infectious diseases. And you know, we, we understand the, the reason for that now. So in London, there, um, there was a nurse named Florence Nightingale. She worked at King's College Hospital. And in 1854, there was a Crimean War that broke out uh, that London was a part of. And Florence persuaded the government to send her and some nurses she was training to help in the hospitals there. When she got there, you know, the hospital, the, the you know, mobile hospital units in, in wartime were even worse than the hospitals in London. So she and her nurses uh, just set about trying to clean up the hospitals and providing the patients with healthy food and clean bed linens, clean clothing, and the death rate did drop 
So she was called a national hero. When the war ended, she went home and she inspired changes at uh, hospitals in London and throughout the rest of England. Also during uh, this early time was a a uh, French scientist named Louis Pasteur, and I'm sure you've heard of him uh, because we pasteurize our milk. <laughs> but um, uh, Mr. Pasteur um, proposed the germ theory of illness. So moving away finally from the four humors and the miasma, he proposed that microbe caused de 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 excuse me, decay. And for that reason, he also theorized that decay was happening in human bodies, and that was the primary cause of diseases. And he also proposed the air is full of microbes, and microbes could be killed by heating them. Uh, he developed this process when he was doing studies on uh, wine fermentation. Uh, and anyway, by, by working on that, he was able to accidentally almost find out that microbes um, were in the air. So Pasteur's work led to what we call now the scientific method. And this is an important precept of all uh, scientific work from his time until today. And what it states is that observation will lead a scientist to ask a question about some phenomenon. And, you know, it might be, it might be anything, you know, like, well, why does, uh, why does bread get get ruined if it sits out forever. So he, the scientist then generates an hy a hypothesis like, you know, oh, well, uh, it doesn't get cooked and so, you know, the air contaminates it or whatever. And then the scientist designs and conducts an experiment to test his hypothesis. And then based on the observed result, he either accepts, rejects, or modifies his hypothesis. So I'm, I'm repeating this because it is important, and this is obviously a test question. Uh, the scientific method, the four parts of it are observation, hypothesis, experiment, accept, reject, or modify hypothesis. And in the critical learning, I will probably ask you a, a question uh, about this as well, so you can, you can look forward to that. <laughs> All right, so Pasteur was a really great guy and uh, important in his era, as was uh, Dr. Koch. And he was one of the first to answer what causes disease. So he examined colonies of microorganisms in human or animal fluids, and then he took blood, pus, or other you know, human gunkiness and smeared it on potatoes or gelatins. And in this way, he was trying to recreate a growth medium for these microbes, and he watched to see if it grew, and some of it did. And when it did, he would inject it back into an animal and ask the question, did it now cause disease in this animal? And then the, 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 the final step of his experiment was he wanted to re-isolate it from the animal. So let's just say, um, you know, you've got a mouse. Well, first you've got someone who's got, you know, a skin skin ulcer, you know, something scabby or ugly and pussy on their arm. So he would then take it and grow it on a potato to make sure that, you know, it was alive and it was growing. And then he would inject that into a mouse. And if the mouse got sick, well, he knew that it was caused by that particular organism. And then he would um, euthanize the mouse mouse and um, check to see that the bacterium or other uh, microbe was causing the uh, infection. And here it is just in diagra diagrammatic form. Here's the mouse. He has a sick mouse, so then he, he checks and he sees microbes in the mouse blood or the mouse tissue. Then he grows it onto a medium. Once he has enough, he will re-inject it into a mouse. The mouse then dies, and then he can again re-isolate it looking under the microscope. So this led to the formulation of what are now called Koch's postulates. And again, another important set of four items. So first of all, the same microorganism must be present in every case of the disease. Second, the microorganism must be isolated and grown in pure culture from the diseased host. Third, the microorganism from that culture must cause disease when inoculated into a healthy susceptible host. 
And finally, the microorganism must be isolated from an experimentally infected lab host, which again just describes um, the graphic that we just took a look at. And here it is again. I've just included this because um, this one has some wording on it. Sometimes this is easier for, for people to follow along. And um, basically, it just says the same thing. So I'm going to continue on, but you can certainly come back and, and read this if this particular view is helpful. So here's a picture of Mr. Or excuse me, Dr. Robert Koch, who also in 1876 discovered the bacteria which caused anthrax. We'll talk about anthrax later in the course, but for right now, you can just know that it it basically causes a disease in cattle. And at that time, uh, you know, cattle were being grown and sold and, you know, uh, any kind of, um, you know, disease that hurt industry, people wanted to know what it was and try and figure out a way to, to stop it. So this was the first time anyone in the world ever had identified a specific microbe, in this case a bacteria, that caused a specific disease. So 1876, um, that was a very remarkable achievement. Then again in 1882, he discovered the causative agent for tuberculosis and going on a huge roll here in 1883, he discovered the causative agent for cholera. So we will talk about anthrax, tuberculosis, and cholera later in the course. Um, but it's just nice to recognize Dr. Koch's contribution to learning what those diseases were. So the next question, after they started learning that there were agents causing disease, was how can we prevent these? You know, like, what's the deal? We, we know how people get it, so now we've got to figure out a way to stop it or to prevent it. Well, Edward Jenner, one of my, one of my favorite guys, um, he observed, this is in the 1700s, or mid, early to mid-1700s, I believe, um, he observed that dairy maids were protected from a ravaging disease called smallpox if they had previously had cowpox. Now, cows get a disease similar to smallpox, uh, and it is infectious to humans, but it creates a much milder degrees, de milder disease uh, than uh, smallpox does. So he had noticed that, you know, these milkmaids who had been working with cattle never got smallpox. So he concluded that cowpox protected against smallpox. Didn't understand exactly why, but um, as time went along, he decided to create an experiment. And in May of 1796, he found a young dairy maid by the name of Sarah Nels, Nelms, and she had cowpox at the time. So she had some fresh lesions on her face uh, and her body. And so he used a little bit of the pus from her lesions and he injected the pus from those lesions into a little boy by the name of James Phipps. And you can see in this image down here, uh, James is getting inoculated while uh, his mother holds him. Uh, <laughs> sure, he wasn't thrilled about that, but hopefully she wasn't too bothered by it. Anyway, the boy did develop cowpox, and on day 10, he completely recovered. Then later in July, remember he inoculated him in May, in July he inoculated the boy again, but this time with, lesion, with pus from a smallpox lesion. I'm sure the mother wasn't thrilled about that one. But anyway, no disease developed. And so Jenner then, was then able to conclude that cowpox did in fact protect people from smallpox. So this experiment that he did really was the first vaccination. It was a deliberate mechanism of protection uh, by injecting this uh, little James with cowpox virus, it protected him from uh, developing smallpox. Now, the reason it is now called a vaccination is because vaca is Latin for cow, and the first experiment did involve a cow. So, moving on to how can we prevent infection and disease? Uh, this is another, another great, great story I love. Uh, so, in the OB wards, um, there was a huge death rate of mothers. And, you know, part of it, they didn't really do cesarean sections, but mostly women 
got infections and they died. I mean, that's not well publicized, but it was very well known at the time. So anyway, there was a huge death rate of 20 to 25% of anybody who gave birth. Well, um, Dr. Semmelweis was a, a teacher at a medical school, and he saw that some of his um, trainees were coming from the morgue, and they'd get a call saying a, a woman was being devel uh, delivered. She was having a child, so they'd rush up, and then they'd go into the OB ward, and they would uh, deliver the baby. Well, he thought maybe there was something to this, and so he uh, introduced and insisted that all of his physicians wash their hands with chlorinated lime juice before they walked into the OB ward and delivered babies. Because women at that time had been dying from something called purpural fever, which is essentially a disease. It's a, it's a bacterial infection and it causes like a rash with a bunch of purple dots, which is basically, you know, your, you get, your entire bloodstream gets infected. But by doing this, he decreased deaths from 20 to 25 percent down to less than than 1 percent. So he's definitely a hero in in my book. And then in 1834, um, uh, uh, Joseph Lister discovered that phenol or carbolic acid was useful in treating surgical instruments. So before this, you know, they probably would wash the blood off of surgical instruments, but then they would reuse them. But he found that um, this carbolic acid had been treating sewage to try and clean up some of the sewage problem. And by killing the sewage, it decreased the smell. Uh, and so he theorized, well, What's good for the sewage might be good for the instruments. So he started using um, uh, carbolic acid to clean instruments. He also, when he would, just before he would open up a patient, he would spray the patient, as you can see in this image, um, he would spray the area with carbolic acid. And um, then he would then cut into the patient. And just by these two methods, he decreased surgical infections by two thirds. So that was a huge, a huge um, advancement in surgical medicine. Now, you might be familiar with the name Lister as in Listerine, and that's exactly where Listerine comes from. So there was uh, an American inventor by the name of Joseph Lawrence, and in order to honor Dr. Lister, he named his product Listerine. And the original Listerine, as you can see from this image, immediately apply Listerines to cut scratches and small wounds to prevent infection, and it did in fact contain some carbolic acid. Well, um, then we can just kind of summarize a bit here. By the, by the 1900s, the end of the industrial period, hospitals were very different than at the start. At the start, there was no hand washing, there was no cleaning of surgical instruments. Um, people died primarily of infections and, um, and, and due to the germ theory, then we discovered that germs were the cause or you know microbial agents were the cause of disease and so <coughs> uh, medicine focused on cleaning up and sanitizing hospitals performing aseptic surgery training doctors in the use of uh, sterilized instruments and cleaning their hands and uh, the the hospital as well as uh, florence nightingale uh, cleaning up hospitals and then pain and infection ended due to some of these anesthetics and antiseptics. So by the time the century turned around to 1900, the cause of infection, or excuse me, the cause of death had dramatically decreased from infectious disease. So if we look over on the right-hand side, we can see the leading cause of death in 1850 were all infectious diseases, tuberculosis, dysentery, cholera, et cetera, as I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture. And in 1900, on the left side of the image, we see that pneumonia, tuberculosis, diarrhea are still up there, but other types of uh, diseases are now causing more deaths, heart disease, stroke, liver disease, accidents, cancer, and quote unquote normal aging, because the germ theory of disease was such a huge advancement in medicine. And that's about it for industrial medicine.
um, except the few things that were left to do, and that was that blood loss was still a problem. They did not yet have transfusion medicine, so they didn't, you know, transfuse bloods. Uh, the only vaccination was for smallpox. Clean water was was still not provided. Um, there was still, you know, it was from from wells or, you know, just just some random source uh, pond or lake or something. And we needed to include more sewers to dispose of waste properly. We needed to uh, make public toilets less accessible and have more private toilets in homes uh, rather than everyone sharing, you know, one toilet, you know, in a two city block area. We needed to increase street lighting and public parks for exercise. And those advancements would come after the uh, turn of the century and again would make a huge impact on uh, disease and the prevention of disease.